Okay, so uh, welcome to tonight's Summer Centre of Taiwan Studies um, uh, seminar. Uh, tonight we've got um, what we could say is the first uh, lecture in our contemporary um, uh, Taiwan Indigenous Studies um, uh, lecture series. We, we finished the last Indigenous Studies project uh, last Friday, and now we're starting a, a, a new one. Uh, this is part of a two-year project that's sponsored by uh, Srini Mu uh, Museum in, 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 uh, um, in Taiwan. And we're going to be focusing on um, indigen contemporary indigenous issues. So it's going to be a little bit different from that, our former, our previous very historical uh, projects that Nikki Alford uh, ran. Um, today's speaker is uh, one of our former uh, students, uh, Daniel uh, Davids. So Daniel first became interested in Taiwan when he was an undergraduate student. Uh, at, uh, he was at Sussex University and they uh, on development studies. Um, and one of the wonderful things about Sussex University is they're one of the few UK universities that offer uh, the possibility of doing a, a year abroad or a term abroad um, in, um, uh, in Taiwan. In Sussex's case, um, uh, they work with National Taiwan University. So that was uh, Daniel's first taste of, um, uh, of Taiwan. Um, after he graduated, he lived in Taiwan for a couple of years, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, he came back uh, to the UK to do his um, MA, and um, uh, Daniel did uh, MA Taiwan Studies at, at SOAS in 2013 to uh, 14. Uh, he was part of um, a remarkable uh, Taiwan politics um, uh, uh, group that year in, in uh, 2013-14, which was also uh, BU's first year um, uh, on, on the team. So it, it was here when Taiwan Studies was really uh, taken off at, uh, at SOAS. Um, and he was, a, again, a quite a remarkable uh, student. And he did, uh, because he did the kind of things that we, as teachers, we want students to, uh, to do. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so, for example, um, he joined the, um, he got accepted for the EATS conference, the European Association of Taiwan uh, Studies, uh, where he gave the first version um, of his dissertation uh, project that looked at the way uh, indigenous, uh, Taiwan ind indigenous issues were uh, covered in Taiwan's uh, political propaganda, particularly looking at election. Uh, advertisements. And I think that um, looking in the audience, I can see that we've got, uh, let's see, um, uh, one other former uh, EATS presenter and one um, future. Oh, uh, oh yeah, no, sorry, two, two um, uh, um, former EATS presenters and, and one future each EATS uh, presenter. So I think that, uh, I think we, anyone that's been, oh, of course, me and B as well, <laughs> I think we can all agree what an impact this could have on, on dissertation uh, projects. Uh, Daniel then went on to um, further develop uh, this into a, um, a di distinction grade uh, dissertation that was really full of um, uh, original um, uh, analysis. Uh, the, and it was, it, it was something of a rare breed in terms of dissertation, because it was the kind of dissertation that made both BU and me uh, happy, which is not, not easy uh, to do, um, um, because of our different kind of uh, approaches. Um, and of course, one of the wonderful things is that uh, some people, uh, when they graduate, then they drop their original uh, studies. But Daniel's kind of uh, continued to embrace um, uh, Taiwan. And uh, he's returned to Taiwan since uh, graduating and started a PhD, which again is, is one of the, um, the things that, uh, as, uh, as teachers, we love to see our students carrying on their, uh, their projects. So um, uh, he's completed the first year of his PhD program at uh, National uh, Georgetown University uh, in uh, in Kaohsiung. Um and he's currently just taking a bit of a break, but he's about to restart this uh, this project. So tonight, tonight's talk is kind of a reflection uh, on his earlier dissertation work. But he's also tried to kind of take this this project um, uh, forward. Okay, so um, on that note, let's give Daniel a very big welcome back to. to <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you to David for having me back, um, and to you as well, of course. Um, so, as David said, today what I'm going to be sharing is 
As I'm sure some slides are exactly the same as my Eve slides. So, uh, <laughs> five years ago. Um, for, I'm, I'm currently working on my PhD. Um, so I'm looking down a few different avenues. So what I want to present today is um, two or two and a half bits of research which I've started. They're all on uh, a similar kind of um, lines of inquiry. They're all about the use of, of imagery, about the use of voice or use of articulation um, to promote or use Aboriginal people for some kind of political um, purpose. So this is something which I want, I came to SOAS wanting to study this. And that was, that was what, four years ago, five years ago. I'm still, I still want to study it, right? Um, and so, now I've gone back to Taiwan. I live in, I live in Pingdong. Um, I live, my wife is Paiwantu, um, so she's from Paiwan tribe. And I've been as active as possible in different community activities there. So I've been working with arts projects, I've been working with education projects, and then community development projects there. And every one of my experiences leads me down the same line of inquiry towards why. Why, why are the conditions the way they are now? And what I mean is that in Taiwan, the Aboriginal population is very small. It's only about 2%, about 500,000 people. Um, there's currently, I think, 16 recognized tribes. There's more than 11 or 12 who aren't recognized. But this is still 2% of the population. But if you look towards politics, if you look towards the main stage, you will always see an Aboriginal person there. Um, and this has always really intrigued me. And so one side of it, I just want to understand why. And then I want to understand, is there a reciprocation? Is it that the Aboriginal image is used, and from that use there's a benefit to local communities? Or is it some kind of misappropriation? Is it this image is being used for the benefit of, of the elite, of the political elite, with no resonation um, within, within the villages themselves? So this is what I've been looking at. And these are two kind of ways which I think we can investigate that. Then hopefully I'll be able to move it into something um, slightly more focused. Um, <laughs> there will be a couple of photos in there just to make sure you're awake. Um, so this is my, the, the presentation outline is just I'm going to be giving you a brief background and the idea of indigeneity, <coughs> so of, of indigenous cultures in Taiwan. <coughs> Um, and then I'll introduce kind of the theory which got me interested in this and what I'm using as a crutch um, for, for the majority of my research. I'll look a bit at the methods um, and why I've chosen to, to research in the way I have. Um, and then I'll be presenting both research on domestic use of Aboriginal image and then international. Um, the international I think will be new to view and that bit. So, um, that's what I'm, I'm really kind of excited about right now. Um, so, as, as I just said, and I'm sure most people are quite aware, the Aboriginal people in Taiwan, they only count for 2% of the population. Um, and mostly, they, they are now located uh, in the cities or in the, the mountain ranges of central and, and east Taiwan. Um, I've kind of broken it down into three stages. I mean, this is very simplistic, but this is what, how I understand kind of the, the rise of indigenous um, cultures in Taiwan, or the different steps, the different limits that, that they've had to push past. So there's this idea of um, kind of the 1600s, 17th century, when there was the first contact with Europeans and there was large-scale migration from, from China, from mainland China. At this point, it was very much assimilate or move out. So if you assimilate and there's mixing with, with the Han population, um, which did occur in, in huge numbers, or groups were marginalized and they were pushed closer and closer towards the, towards the mountains. Now, this was, there was a lot of conflict in that time. But for me, I see it's, um, 
Japanese colonial rule. This is when it became institutionalized. This was institutionalized assimilation. So while there were strong fences put up blocking Aboriginal peoples from, from Han people, um, in this time of institutionalized assimilation, as I call it, there was a huge push for the relocation and the centralization of Aboriginal peoples. So what this means is that every village had to be registered. Every village needed to have a police station in it. Every village needed to have a school in it. And so you can imagine um, populations which were actually quite sparsely um, divided around regions, they were forced to live in a, in a way of life which was not theirs. Um, and in some ways that's the nice part of it. From local research that I've been doing um, in, in Ping Dong, the stories that you hear of the atrocities which occurred both under Japanese and then Kuomintang and, and KMT leadership are quite frightening. There were whole villages burned to the ground, any kind of items of cultural worth were destroyed, clothing was destroyed. Um, there were times where all of the men, literally every man in the village was taken away and they, they were put in prison. Right, so you get this idea of the, the huge demonization there was of this group of people. But then if you move towards the, the modern Taiwan now, multinational Taiwan now, um, and the movement of minority rights, there's been a complete reversal. This isn't a culture which we need to teach away. You don't need to send people to villages to teach Aboriginal people how to use chopsticks anymore. Right? This is a, a culture which is, or various cultures, which are hugely um, valued and that they used a lot. And so it's this transition, this transition from, from demonized to valued. This is what I want to look at. This is what I want to understand. Um, so the way, the way I've gone about this is using something that actually Bu intro introduced to me, um, which was uh, Stuart Hall and his theory of articul articulation. Um, so for me, I love this idea because it's, um, articulation is described as the way that you make an object into a subject. The way that your voice, the words that you use, the images that you attach to someone produces that person and how that person is perceived. And I think this is hugely important for this line of inquiry. So I want to understand the site of struggle, which is um, the articulation of, of Aboriginal peoples, to understand how the, the elite, the political elite, are representing Aboriginal peoples, and then on the other side, how the Aboriginal peoples themselves um, identify um, themselves, or what do they link their identity to. Um, so I'll be using the theory of articulation for that. And it's definitely connected to this idea of imagined communities by Benedict Anderson. The, the nation that you're part of is constantly being created, and it's through um, published materials, it's through actually actual campaigns which nationalism is created. And Taiwan is an, an amazing example of that. We can see throughout time different stages of nationalism that has gone through um, towards what I would call now the multinational. Domestically, I'll be looking at those works, and then for the international side, I'll be looking at Joseph Nye and the idea of soft power. So to understand that, especially in Taiwan, where it's so squeezed diplomatically, um, there are other ways to create ties with different nations. So international relations isn't only about war and money, it's about language and culture and values. And that's something where I see a huge connection with the use of um, what I would call the Austronesian narrative in Taiwan as a way to create um, relationships with other Southeast Asian uh, countries. So in, in terms of methodology, um, I like to, to pretend that it's formal. Um, but what I do is, I'm sure if anyone's worked with this kind of survey, um, based research, you just get hundreds of videos, you get hundreds of articles, and you sift your way through them, and you do what you can do with them. Um, so I managed to narrow it down to three questions. 
broad questions, but three questions nonetheless. I wanted to see how the prominence of Aboriginal content has varied in political discourse. So the amount of times that political elite talk about Aboriginal people, show images of Aboriginal people, how has this varied over time and to what effect? Secondly, I wanted to, and I was quite reluctant to even start this because I didn't want it to become a blue-green type issue. But the more I was looking at the data, this is something that we need to look at. We can use this to predict certain trends and then also to, to be able to understand the, the strategies of the different political parties. Um, and then thirdly, and this is what I, I myself am most interested in, is how does this political discourse, this creation of Aboriginal peoples by the government, how does this relate to the reality of the communities? Um, and so it's that third part which I'm, I'm currently doing now. I'm trying to uh, create these connections between the theory and the political campaigns to the reality of the villages. So what I did to understand the domestic side of this was I did a survey of every single campaign ad uh, for the presidential elections between uh, 1996 and 2012, just waiting on the 2016 months. <laughs> And I went through and I made a note of every time there was an image, a song, um, any writing, um, or any Aboriginal languages, just so I could understand how, how common was this. Um, and then for the international survey, what I did is I looked at government press releases. So for me, this is another voice of the government. This is another voice of, um, of the state, which... Um, I felt we could, we could look at and we could try and use to understand the discourse that was being created. And for this survey, I was looking at the use of Austronesian, okay, which I would explain in a minute. So, first of all, why, why presidential election ads? Why did I choose to do this? Um, there's Jonathan Sullivan and, and Daphne have done a huge amount of work around advertising. Um, in Taiwan, and there's this idea that these are the main point of contact between the, the campaign or the, the candidate and the populace. So the way that a, a party or a candidate presents themselves, this is calculated. This is they are trying to appeal to the largest audience, they're trying to get elected. Um, and it's all about showing the legitimacy and how they meet the expectations. So. This isn't, this isn't random, this is very much calculated. So for me, I thought that these ads were the perfect way to see not only who the candidates are, but who they believe the electorate to be, and what they believe the electorate wants to see. So as I said, I looked over um, more than 500 campaign ads, um, and folk mainly focused on the major parties. And I broke them up into, into different categories. So that was the political party campaign, so the year and the party, uh, the form of content. So I was looking at content which was uh, visual, audio, uh, and language based. And then at the different messages that came. So this is looking at the issues, the ideologies, um, and then the kind of candidate promotion, which, which we often see. There's a lot of data, um, and it can be presented in a lot of ways. But this is one of the graphs which I like, <laughs> which I like the most. Um, so you can see this is the proportion of Aboriginal content in ads. So at its highest, we have 25% of ads um, of the KMT for that year had some kind of Aboriginal content. And if you remember, I said that the population is only 2%. Then this is interesting. Why is there such a large um, proportion? And this, slightly misleading, this is the total. So really we should start from the second, second column there. And you'll see that the DPP were quite slow to take up on this in comparison to the KMT. But the KMT have always, they've consistently 
used Aboriginal peoples within their campaign ads. And so for me, um, this was very much um, predictable. If you look at the KMT, they, they have the, iron, the, the, the Aboriginal people are the iron votes for the KMT, or they were traditionally. The KMT um, had managed to, to connect itself with the tribes and with the villages um, and with the families so much that the KMT are always, have always been linked to these communities, so they always, they're always have that vote. So the idea that they would include Aboriginal peoples within their campaigns to kind of solidify that base um, made a lot of sense for me. Um, but the DPP, and you'll see in other research, the DPP, their use of Aboriginal content is slightly different. You'll see how it comes um, slightly later, and there's no, um, there's no really trend that we can see. But it's, it's also surprising for a party which we see as being Hoklo nationalist, with a party that we see as being based on um, the Minan, the Taiwanese, as opposed to the, the Chinese. Um, so for them to even include this was, was quite surprising. And so if we move towards kind of more qualitative um, assessment, we can see that if you look at the kind of issues which were mentioned, is this candidate promotion is the first one, um, which, which is a little bit sad, right? That you're using these people not to represent any um, issue which is at hand or anything ideological uh, about, about the nation, but it's a way that someone can promote themselves. So if, if you were to look through the videos, what I mean by this is it's Mang Jo shaking hands with an Aboriginal person or dressing up or dancing or something like this, which personally, in my own opinion, um, I don't think it really, it, it won't resonate with the, with the Aboriginal populations. There, there's no addressing of the serious issues which should be addressed. Um, and this is something which I would then later come to see again and again. Um, the, the second most common use of Aboriginal content was to produce this idea of multiculturalism. Um, so what this is, is the idea of the four ethnic groups. Um, and it's the story which started with Li Dang Hui and then it carried on. Uh, it's also a narrative which I feel has been produced. Um, and that, so that was more what I was looking for. I was trying to see this use of Aboriginal peoples to promote this narrative this multicultural Taiwan narrative, which very much came through. And it was not only the KMT, but also the DPP, um, which, were, which were promoting this narrative. Um, the more that I looked at the, the images and the songs being used, um, I noticed that these were purely romantic images. They were an image to, to show look, I'm a good person, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm spending time with Aboriginal peoples, you know, it's, it's kind of like a charity case. They start to come along and along. And there's this idea of naturalization of social issues. Um, so you have certain campaign ads where you have the candidate walking hand in hand with a disabled person, an elderly person, and an Aboriginal person. And so there's this naturalization of the problem that this is the way it is, and I, I, will, I will help these poor people, uh, which I, I mean, as an Aboriginal person, I, I don't know I, how they would feel, but this, for me, seems to be naturalizing certain issues um, and not actually attacking them head on. Another, another side, which is very much connected to this, uh, the romantic image produced, was this reduction to a cultural other. It's very... There's no content. There's nothing that you can really understand about this person other than they are different. And this has led to kind of a backlash. I mean, this is something that I'll talk about later. But even myself, if I watch some of the videos, I can see 
misrepresentation um, where people are wearing the wrong clothes, you know, or there's an example of um, Mangjo dancing hand in hand like this, right? If, if you know the traditional dance of Taiwan, they're, they're celebrated because they're open hands. You don't hold hands to the person next to you, but the person over one. And so to see Mangjo like this, and this is something which came up a lot, this image of you know, tangled hands, um, it's something which has come back and again and again just to show how there's really been this appropriation of the culture just for some political gain. And so that's what I was looking at with here. There's a lot more to look at, there's a lot more data to go through. Um, but what I thought that I could see was these two clear messages that it's all about creating an image, this image of multiculturalism, or this image of a, an amazing candidate. And then secondly, there was no, no work on issues. And there was a, even the naturalization of issues. So to move on, um, this is the second bit of research that I did, um, which is looking at news releases. What I mean by this is the, the information which is published on the government website from, from the president, um, which is available to everyone. And just like the campaign ads, this is a direct form of communication between the state um, and, and the people. So again, I see this as being calculated, and I see this as being some, um, a form of articulation. This is a form of discourse creation. This is the official narrative of what the government believes. Um, and so, again, I looked at the same time period, um, starting at 1996. However, uh, because I had the materials, I moved this on to 2018. And what I searched for was not indigenous, but Austronesian because I wanted to understand how the idea of an Austronesian narrative, of Austronesian Taiwan, how much this was produced by the government of Taiwan and then reproduced in its uh, communications with, with nations abroad. So the Austronesian narrative is the idea, um, and I'm not here to, to say true or false, but it's a, a theory that the, the Austronesian peoples which stretch from Taiwan to, to New Zealand, from Madagascar to Hawaii, their central point of dispersal was Taiwan. The, I mean, the whole, the whole idea is that it's a, it's a linguistic group, correct? So um, the, the linguistic group or, and the cultural group somehow went from Taiwan and then moved southwards. It's not supposed to be a genetic trail. It's not saying that this is colonization, but there was, there was the spreading of language and the spreading of culture. That's one idea. There have been other ideas talked about, the idea that actually Aboriginal peoples came from mainland China, or that they came from the what now would be Malaysia. But from these three different narratives that you could have, this idea of the Austronesian narrative of which Taiwan was the hub, where there was this huge explosion of, of um, cultural and, in, and linguistic development. This is the one which has been taken up by the state. And for me, there's a reason for that. There's definitely a reason for that. So this is what I wanted to look at. Not if it was true or not, but how it was used. And so again, I went through each, um, each of these news releases, and I tried to identify what they were being used for. And I found three major um, sections, which was for diplomatic missions. So this is um, either bilateral or multilateral connections to different nations in the South Pacific. Uh, for international conferences held in Taiwan. Or domestic events. Now I'm not really going to discuss domestic events later, so um, just briefly. These domestic events are usually once a year on the 10th of October, there will be the presidential speech. And at some point in there, we will say, we have Austronesian roots. 
Um, and that's more or less what it is. It's kind of the only constant domestic use of this term, Austronesia. Um, so these are the results I got from that. So you have the domestic events in blue, the international conferences in red, diplomatic missions in yellow. And then the blue and the green shows the, the party in charge. So now you'll see why I had to do this blue-green comparison, because the results that you get are just, are just way too interesting. Um, so when I looked at it, the first use of Austronesian was in 1999. So this was still Lee Deng Hui. Um, and this was, I guess, a little bit late on, but it was in, um, in line with the Go South policy. So it's an economic policy, it's a cultural policy, it's a political policy to move away from the mainland and to create a, a place for Taiwan in, in South Asia, or South, Southeast Asia. Um, and this is something that Li Donghui started, that Chen Sui Bian carried on in 2005, um, and now Tsai Ing-wen has now carried on again. And within this Go South policy, Austronesian people, or the Austronesian narrative of the Aboriginal people of Taiwan, has always been there. Um, I've got a couple of quotes which, which I find entertaining. Um, so you have Chen Sui Bian. So the nations we're talking about are like Palau, um, Nauru, Kiribati, Tuvalu, Marshall Islands, Solomon Islands, the few diplomatic um, ties that Taiwan still has, but it's also the Philippines and it's also New Zealand. Okay, so these are bigger economies um, and more influential countries which Taiwan really has no space to interact with formally. Um, so this is really a very, very, very unique. Um, and this is something which deserves more, more recognition, the place of Aboriginal people in international relations in Taiwan. Because the Aboriginal people of Taiwan were attending the UN in 1988 when there was no Taiwanese representative allowed. But Aboriginal peoples, um, they have continuously been able to, to be involved in different forms of, of diplomacy um, because of their origins, because of their heritage. Um, so there's a quote which I wanted to talk about. So Chen Sui Bian talks about a shared culture with the, with the people of Nauru. Um, they talk about their Austronesian roots. He even goes as far to, to talk about how blood is thicker than water. So this is why um, I think it was Kiribati and Taiwan have such good relations, right? Because blood is thicker than water. So this whole idea is not just the Austronesian narrative, but that also is then reflected on the politicians themselves. Um, it's a way of creating a diplomatic tie, where otherwise there, there, isn't, there is not. Uh, even Ma ying who you can see in his period of his administration, so from the second half of 2008 up to 2016, he cut all the all bilateral and multilateral talks. Um, abroad at least. So um, there was the, the forum, the Austronesian forum, which was set up by Chen Sui Bian and was hugely successful. This was a forum which brought together the different Austronesian um, nations and the leaders of all of these nations and actually ended up in a UNESCO bid to, to have Taiwan recognized as the, um, as the root of, of Austronesian cultures. So again, they were using the Austronesian narrative um, and this Austronesian connection to create a platform for which they can speak um, in, on, in places like the UN in different international events. And even though Manjo, he cut all of those ties, when Tsai Ing-wen came back into power, they went straight on. They carried on with it straight away. And so this year, and well, and last year, there was a sustainable Austronesia working together for a better future. Right, so that's, that's probably the reason I had so many results, because it was the name of her tour. Um, but it's something very interesting to see how, 
whenever Taiwan wants to focus southwards, to focus away from China, the Austronesian heritage suddenly becomes a key point of this. Um, these international conferences was another really interesting way that uh, the state were able to create some kind of diplomatic power or soft power um, through this Austronesian narrative. All of these conferences were attended by either the head of state, so the president, or the vice president. So this wasn't just a, a conference for academics. This was a conference bringing the leaders of these nations together. And the, the Austrian, Austronesian conference, which is held now, you will have people from Canada, you will have people from Hawaii, you will have people from Madagascar, so all over the world going to take part in this. Which for Taiwan, which has always been so squeezed um, diplomatically, is something very important. Um, now this is, this is something slightly different. This is where I'm trying to understand, so what? Right? You have all of this happening on, on the world stage, on the political stage. How does this affect the people in the communities and in, in the villages? And so this still needs a lot of work. But this is a brief oversight of um, when new legislation was put in, when there were new acts for, for the protection of Aboriginal cultures or minority rights um, or land. And you can see, again, it's blue and green, um, so for KMT and DPP, you'll see that in my and Joe's administration, there was not one new act put through for the protection of Aboriginal peoples. Um, now, this is slightly misleading. There were procedural acts or managerial acts. So this is um, an act which goes through to say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. But there was no new laws put in for the protection of minority rights, um, which I found very interesting. And so to try and find a correlation between actual government um, action and their use of this Aboriginal discourse, I find extremely interesting. Um, for this, it shows a, a, a positive correlation, that when there was a lot of use of the, the Austronesian narrative by the DPP, they are actually putting new legislation through. So for the, for the average voter, those iron votes of the KMT, maybe this kind of information could, could influence that. Um, and it's something which really, really needs to be researched. I mean, you have like, the, basic, the basic people's law, indigenous people's basic law. This is a law which gives the right to hunt but that's not recognized. You know, you have the return of land, again, it's not recognized. So the fact that these laws have gone through and the acts have been passed, <coughs> that's a positive thing, but we shouldn't just accept that that means that they are being, about, that they're being abided by. Um, so this is just one part of this new research that I'm trying to do to understand what correlation is there between the production of an Austronesian or indigenous narrative um, and then the, the actual livelihoods of, of Aboriginal peoples. Um, so, and from the information I've just shown you, there are some, um, some key pieces of information we can take. We can see that Aboriginal heritage has been constantly used um, in diplomatic talks um, and in, in campaign ads um, since, since 1966. And we can so see that there are strong links between the, multi, the multicultural discourse in Taiwan and the indigenous discourse in Taiwan. These are where you can see positive correlations between these. Um, and there's a bipartisan um, acceptance of the Austronesian narrative, um, not only as being true, but as an international image of Taiwan, some, a way that both parties feel that they can present Taiwan to the outside world. Um, and that Austronesian narrative was very successful. You, if you look at the, the bilateral, multilateral um, ties which were created through this Austronesian narrative and with these nations, they're some of the strongest ties that they have. Um, there's 
recently AMSTEC went through, which is the, the free trade agreement between New Zealand and Taiwan. The first stage of that was a cultural exchange, an Aboriginal cultural exchange. Um, there's also a cooperative act with Philippines. So there's no free trade act, but there is a cooperation for the protection of indigenous peoples. Um, and even um, the Pacific Arts uh, Conference, Pacific Arts event, which happens every year, which invites all the Austronesian or artists from different Austronesian countries to take part. Taiwan has been now accepted for that, where for more than 20 years they were refused every time. And so I see the, the pushing of this Austronesian narrative by the state as being a reason for that. However, of course, we, we still need to investigate. At the same time, while there have been these successes in the state, there have still been um, the, the idea of misrepresentation was still very valid. There was a lot of people um, in places of power, but then also within communities where they saw the Aboriginal image was not being correctly represented. So I gave the one example of the dancing. Um, and this happened with songs and it's happened with clothing time and time again, especially for diplomatic events. So for some people from these communities, they find this very offensive. The idea that their culture is being used, but not understood. Um, so that's something that needs to be recognized. Um, and then finally, there was this part, positive correlation between uh, the use of the Taiwanese image and then um, the laws going through. But after doing all of this research, I still find myself saying, so what? So what? There's lots of different strategies that, that nations or political parties will use to get more space, to get more, uh, to create dialogue with different actors. So what? And for me, this so what comes down to what are the effects on the communities themselves. This is what's most important for me. Um, so that's why I've started um, to do interviews. Um, and so the interviews are going to be with individuals which are active in either community development work or the cultural sector, and they have some kind of relationship with the state, because I want to understand how this relationship's working. Um, I feel like this is the best way to to see what the effects of this politicization of culture is in the grassroots. Um, so for communities themselves and for community actors. And so the way I'm, I'm going to be doing this is through structured interviews. Um, I've, I've already conducted three interviews. And the findings just from these three interviews, so from um, three hours of conversation, there's so much which I really want to follow and I want to go on um, researching. So the first of this, the, those concerns of misrepresentation, those have been said every single time. People are aware of this. It's probably, maybe it's a social media thing. Once one person sees it, it's spread. So everyone knows in it, about it and everyone is appalled by it. So that's, that's one issue that needs to be further researched. Um, and the second one, which I find quite surprising, is when you saw the graph where it showed um, a large use of Austronesian narrative for international diplomacy, there was a positive correlation between those periods, so Chen Shui-bian and then Tsai Ing-wen, for the amount of opportunities for people within villages to take part in projects and go abroad. So this wasn't just the president going off for a, a trip. There was actually um, communities going, going with, I mean, when I say communities, I literally mean communities. Um, like recently there was a, a show in Taipei where they had a whole village go and perform. What do you think about that? I don't know. But there's large scale, there's large scale movement when these kinds of um, activities take place. And 
if it's for the right reasons or the wrong reasons, you can't deny that to give anyone the opportunity to travel, to give anyone the opportunity to meet um, indigenous peoples or anyone from different countries is something which is going to be hugely beneficial to the group. I mean, that's my personal opinion, and this has been shared with the people that I was interviewing. Um, lastly, and something which uh, makes, me, makes me laugh, um, is that when we talked about this Austronesian narrative, and the Austronesian narrative then allowing more people to go abroad, it turned out once they got there, the Austronesian narrative went away. No one cared. Oh, you're Austronesian? No. You're Austronesian? No, I'm Taiwanese. But okay. So it wasn't, it wasn't real. It wasn't a real connection between these people. But the connection that was there this is the idea that you are an indigenous person. Right? So when they actually come to meet, the whole idea of statehood, that goes away. And it's more community to community. Or someone's individual nationhood um, towards another minority group, which I found really, really interesting. That no matter if we see as, as top-down orientated action, once it gets to the, to the people and to the grassroots layer, the most important ties are the ones which are there with or without the government, their cultural ties. So this is something which I really, really want to carry on researching and, and would like to, to further understand. So more or less that's the research I've done. As I said, it's the many avenues I wish to travel. Um, so if you do have any comments, or you do have any questions, or you have you know, anything which you think correlates with this research, please let me know because I'm very, very um, interested to hear in ways that I can take this research further. Thank you. Okay, that was uh, fantastic. It was, um, um, someone's taken a, a uh, course on Taiwan's politics, domestic politics, and uh, cross-strait relations, international, external relations. That was, um, that was, that was perfect, because you covered, covered both uh, sides of, of the course. And, um, and one of the things that my students kind of get tired of hearing is me going on about how, why, and so what, mm. uh, and and um, uh, and that featured quite heavily as as, as well um, in, in your your presentation. I had a, I had a, had a lot of uh, questions. Um, I'll, I'll try and kind of control myself and not kind of get too uh, carried away. But in terms of the um, um, uh, okay, maybe the first thing I should say is um, in terms of the book project, it sounds sounds perfect because I think what what you've got here is both uh, time series, o broad overviews of, of trends both in political communication, domestically, but also internationally. Um, but it's not just overview. What you, you've also got is original research. So there, there's, um, um, I think you've got the basis for one of one of the book chapters in, in the project. But I think um, it goes much further than that. My, um, I was writing down a note saying, this sounds to me like a book proposal. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, it may turn out to be the uh, uh, something you can develop in, 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 in your PhD, but for me, it was, that was really exciting. In terms of um, uh, kind of concrete questions, one of the things, it, it reminded me of, of some of my own research, and one of the things I found was that um, we often see quite different patterns in TV ads and newspaper ads. Mm. Often when we're looking for, at more kind of concrete um, uh, uh, issues or policy proposals, they actually will come out in newspaper ads. Um, I'm not saying you have to do that, but it might be interesting uh, maybe to look at one election to see how the trends um, uh, differ. Um, you also talk a lot, quite a lot about the reception, and, um, and this reminds me of discussions I've had with people who are looking at migration in Taiwan. And, and one of the <coughs> questions I've been curious about is um, how do migrants actually receive these ads? Um, um, talking to Isabel and, and Lara, generally they've been quite, um, uh, the, the, the argument has been probably the kind of answer that you'll get is that um, they may find them offensive or boring, but I think it would be interesting to try and do some kind of experiment where you actually um, play some of these, these videos to um, indigenous communities and see how they respond. 
and maybe you could set it up as a focus group. Um, I think these kind of experimental approaches can be quite um, uh, useful. Um, and okay, a final kind of um, uh, question. I'll, I'll hold the others back. Um, maybe in terms of the why, um, what you could consider is actually talking to people who actually design these ads. Mm. What were they really thinking about um, uh, when they, they um, uh, for example, uh, if we think of uh, Mind Joe's Juan Loco, uh, the, you know, the hat, the, one of your, your classic multicultural ones that you, um, um, the, with the, uh, the four ethnic groups. Um, what was the thinking behind those indigenous uh, images? Why did they choose um, uh, to that particular tribe? Because that was a land use clip that we, we got in that, in that video. So I think that would be interesting just to get into the minds of the designers of these, these ads. Okay, so there, there's a few kind of comments probably more comments than, than questions, but if, if you had any responses. Um, I think the, the, I do need to recognize the limitations of, of the research or something. As much as you want to ignore them, you do have to see them. And so I talked a lot about this idea of the romanticization of culture mm -hmm. and that you have this very shallow view of, of indigenous um, societies, but how deep can you get? With, uh, with visual content mm -hmm. like that. Um, so that, that is something I need to look at. And I was actually, I had the same conversation with a friend of mine who is a video editor, producer, director. And when I was showing him these, he was like, why would you not use that image? That's, that's mm -hmm. interesting. That's something which immediately gets someone's attention. Um, but I still think that it has to come down to, is it just about getting attention mm -hmm. or is it about articulating someone's identity in, in a way which is suitable. Um, so how much do they care <laughs> is a question that you need to ask. Um, and I think, like you said, by looking through newspaper articles or newspaper advertisements, mm -hmm. that would be extremely interesting. It would be interesting to see whether the, because um, uh, you listed some really interesting pieces of legislation, mm -hmm. were they actually raised during these presidential campaigns? Probably we need to uh, look at uh, newspaper ads and there's a possibility they, they may be there. Mm -hmm. Okay, we better open up for some uh, questions. Yeah, Mark. Thank you, that was interesting. Um, two questions. The indigenous links to New Zealand, mm -hmm. is that with the Maori or the Moriori? The second one was, have you or do you know of any study that's looked at perhaps the um, experience of the Maori in New Zealand politically and how they've got to the point now where the Vice uh, Prime Minister is a Maori and from a, a distinctly Maori party and they actually formed a coalition with a party that was not going to govern by themselves and actually got taken place in the votes by quite a lot in the last election, but they were able to form a um, coalition government as a result. Um, and that's something where, in what you were saying, I hear very distinct parallels in that in New Zealand, I remember in the 80s, for example, um, Maori culture was very much manipulated by the government and by people that weren't Maoris. You did it harder at school, no matter who you um, when the All Blacks played internationally, they do a haka. Um, but those kinds of images, um, it, it was very much misappropriated and used as advertising more than anything else, which seems to be very similar to what you're suggesting. Um, but then they were able to move past that, um, get married in school. It, it was taught in schools, it wasn't back in the 80s, they were able to do things like that. So I'm wondering if you'd seen any similarities or any parallels. Um. First of all, um, for the first question about these links to New Zealand, as far as I know, they are with Maori populations, um, but there are more and more coming up. I know that um, there's the Pulima Awards, which are um, arts awards which are held every year for just indigenous peoples. They're, they're, they were in Kaohsiung last year, and there was a, a Maori group came over for those 
put on awards specifically. And one of the interviews I did was with, um, she's a, a leader of a, a local, of a, of a small community in Pingdong um, called Jiaxing, the, the village. And she's the chief of the village, but she's also the most um, active in community-based projects. And she went to visit um, New Zealand, and that was with the um, the Maori, um, like the Maori Council. I'm not sure I've forgotten the name. Um, and she went there, and that, for that was for her that was the most exciting trip that she'd ever had. Not because she related so well with the Maori people, and, and they did. Um, and that's an interview which um, many people would want to hear because it's a really, really interesting story. Because the reason they were in Taiwan was not because of, uh, the, the reason they were in New Zealand wasn't because of Taiwan, but it was funding from mainland China took them <laughs> to, to New Zealand. Um, but that, that's just besides. Um, what, the, what this lady saw was the future of Taiwan. When she went to New Zealand, she felt she was seeing answers to the problems that there were. So for, for language education, um, which I'm very grateful that you brought up, in Taiwan there's this, there's this idea that language education can happen following the same cultural norms of, of the majority. So you can use a Han way to teach a minority language, which isn't, isn't really working. You know, and, and it's not really working with a whole range of activities, a whole range of events where the structure is still very much mainstream, very much majority or Han. Um, but the results they're looking for are supposed to be tribe you know, specific. And so there's, it's not working in a lot of places. But in New Zealand, in these Maori communities, they saw that there was 100% control. How the schools taught, what they taught, that was completely up to them. Um, so there is definitely a comparison to be made, and I think that by looking at New Zealand, there's a lot to be learned, because I think New Zealand and Switzerland, the two most multicultural nations in the world, um, at least by legislation. So I found that I think that's definitely an area that I need to look into, the, the New Zealand story. Yeah, Douglas and then. Well, you know, thanks for the talk, it was really, really interesting. Well, just to answer your question about the Moriori and the, and the Maori, they're, they're, genet they're linguistically both related, so it would be both. Um, I was curious as far as, like, I, I understand the, the rationale for driving towards kind of pushing the Austronesian narrative to distance themselves from the mainland. But if you look at, say, 2% of the population, even if they are, a high voting percentage, it's still only 2% of the population that would identify as Aborigines. So why would, I guess, why, why would the government invest so much of their energy in, in, in promoting this kind of recreated Aboriginal identity if it's at the risk of alienating 98% of the potential vote? Okay. I mean, I mean, no, I mean, I, I don't know if that's true, I'm just, I'm, I'm asking for your opinion on this. Um. This is something which um, I guess hope would have come through more more in the in the presentation itself. But that that's why I was interested. It's only two percent. Why is there more than twenty five percent of ads with Aboriginal people in? And my own understanding is that it's not about trying just to get Aboriginal ads. It's trying to get ads from everyone, from the electorate, and they see that the electorate as being, at that time, um, interested in multicultural Taiwan. That the, they wanted, they didn't want to vote for a party which was Hoklo nationalist, you know, Minan nationalist. They didn't want someone that represented mainland China. They wanted someone that represented Taiwan as a whole. And so that's, that's why I think this, uh, the, multi uh, the multicultural narrative has come through and why Aboriginal people are so prominent in that. Because they are the only group which hasn't originally come from, from China. 
Um, so that's that's why I see them there, not uh, potentially alienating, but potentially bringing together different parts of the of the um, community of the population. And then when it goes to the Austronesian narrative, as I said, there's only one. There's only just ten ten when the government will actually say Austronesia. This is something which happens for conferences and for happens for diplomacy. It's not, it's not a narrative that you heard being spoken of a lot. It's not taught in schools, for example. Um, so I think that <coughs> it's used for a certain purpose. The purpose of the Austronesian narrative is diplomacy. The, the use of indigenous uh, imagery and ads is for multiculturalism. So I don't think they are alienating, but they're actually trying to bring more people together. Yeah. I was kind of thinking back to um, uh, some of those stereotypical ads that have this, this kind of um, uh, message. And what often happens is that we'll see, I think, all four ethnic groups uh, mm -hmm. in there. The, the Kuala Lumpur, and then uh, Julie Lund's take on that was, was actually pretty, um, um, uh, pretty similar. And one of the things we also discussed um, uh, when Daniel was here was whether we should actually take these ads as negative ads because um, the kind of hidden message there is that um, with the KMT we've got multiculturalism but the DUP uh, tries to stir up ethnic tensions because uh, that was um, again if you look back at some of those ads uh, I think that is part of the message there um, okay yeah but the thank you very much um, it's a pleasure uh, to hear what you're um, saying. We make such a difference from your each uh, presentation. Um, you seem to uh, know quite a, a lot about your uh, subject. <laughs> uh, at that time, he's very nervous. <laughs> um, I, I, um, I have two questions um, relating to uh, your presentation. First of all, um, because your research is from 1996 onward. So um, in the old days, it is true that four ethnic groups constantly being presented as a, a kind of multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, uh, image. But later on, uh, in the 2000s, uh, noughties, sorry, started to have the so-called new immigrants and the sons of, or the second generation of these kind of immigrant uh, spouses. So. The, the addition of this kind of extra group, has it changed the uh, mechanism within this kind of uh, act? Um, do they still play equally important role, or a, a new competitor come into the, uh, the, 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 the picture and, and become another factor, uh, I'm to ask you. Another one is, um, because according to your chart, um, I know you are right, uh, green and blue have very different strategies uh, internationally. Um, uh, mind you, seem to do more uh, conferences. So, so can you give us some idea, what, what's the difference, the effect of different strategies of either using this kind of uh, uh, foreign machine, sorry, missions or using international conferences? So the, the first point that you made about now the introduction, or not the introduction, but the, the visibility of, of people from other East Asian countries, um, and that adding to the multiculturalism of Taiwan, that, that is something um, which you start to see, I think you start to see it in 2012, there are some campaign ads with, um, with Vietnamese yeah, I, didn't want to, I don't know. I don't want to say it like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, we're foreign. I guess I am immigrant. Um, I don't know. It's said. Vietnam. Yeah, but it's not foreign spouses. Yeah, sorry. That's a lot more. The foreign workers, foreign spouses. Yeah. Um, and recently, I, I haven't seen the the, the most recent. Um, presidential campaign ad, so I can't comment on that. But it is something that I've noticed in, um, like, you know the little videos you get in trains? 
-hmm. Have you seen them? The, 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 you have a small video which is just showing this is a synopsis of, of what Taiwan is. I've seen in that, and there has been a lot more foreign spouses, foreign foreign um, workers in there. Um, and it does seem to take away the time from the Aboriginal peoples as well. Ooh. Maybe their clothes are just brighter and more beautiful, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what, what you're saying is really, really, really true. I think that if, like I, like I just said, that indigenous culture is being represented because it shows multiculturalism, if you have another group which also shows multiculturalism, are they going to replace each other? Um, or is it going to, to run parallel? Um, which is something which I'd be really interested to look at. Because not, I think maybe two or three years ago, the, the population of um, immigrants surpassed that of Aboriginal peoples. So there, there are more people from Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, these nations, then there are actually an Austrian, um, Aboriginal peoples in Taiwan. So that is going to be really interesting, to, and to see how that meets up, you know. I've heard, I've heard a lot of funny, like, anecdotal comments about when, for example, when there was tensions between Philippines and Taiwan, um, a lot of Filipino people would say, no, no, I'm Aboriginal. Yeah. <laughs> um, or uh, other times around where when Aboriginal people would, for some reason, pretend to, to be a foreign worker, you know, just could, uh, for whatever reason. And it's funny, it's the way that these the two groups, who are both marginalized, how, how they actually work together. It's quite interesting. Um, and then the, the second question, so about the, the, the different um, campaigns that they that Mang Zhou and Chen Shui Bian in Taiwan, um, their different approach to diplomacy. I mean, neither of them were particularly effective in, in case in terms of having, you know, formal diplomatic ties. Um, but I think that what Mang Zhou seems, and, uh, and even from the news reports from that time, it seemed quite quite visible that he was making a conscious effort to to not have any trouble with the mainland. It was that when Chen Tsui Bian went for these multilateral talks, um, the, the Taiwan Pacific Allies Summit, yeah. there was a backlash um, from China. China, or the mainland administration, they actively spoke out against this. Um, and so Mang Zhou, so this, this Austronesian forum, um, he cancelled it. Uh, the first thing he did, it was supposed to be held in Kaohsiung, he cancelled it. He was supposed to have a trip to, to Solomon Islands, he cancelled it. So he, when he came in, he didn't... He, he knew, Mang Zhou was very aware of wanting to close these, these bilateral and multilateral talks that they were having. I think all of the... All of these um, news releases are about um, people coming to Taiwan. So the governor of Samoa came to Taiwan. Um, so, I mean, about the effect, the successes, there's not a huge amount of successes going on. I mean, maybe economically, you could talk about that, that saying, when with her, with her Go South initiative, there are definitely a lot of successes, but they're not diplomatic successes. They're, um, they're creating economic ties. Under under time when that seems to be the main focus of the Go South policy, to create more industrial avenues. The answer to this may be just no, or I don't know, but um, is anybody offering a critique against um, the Austronesian narrative? I don't mean a critique against plus hypothesis, but as a as a political I, I, idea. I mean, obviously, it's, well, you, you just told us the PRC, but apart from within Taiwan, are any wing actually articulating a, a, an opposition to it? A position against the Austronesian narrative. I've, I've not heard of, of, of one. Um, trying to think. So that leads to a sort of romanticization of in, in your argument that way. The. The, the, the narrative in itself is romanticized, yes, you mean? Yes, nobody against it. It's something everybody's for. So, you know, like, like mm, 
environment, you know, in, in the 70s, you know, <laughs> as Nick, Nixon was supposed to say, everybody's for it, nobody's against it, I, so I'm for environment. Mm. I, I would have thought maybe someone like um, um, Hongshou Zhu would probably say, <laughs> no, I put into that. Because um, I know, for example, we had a little bit of bait when, when we had the Taiwan apology, mm. and, and the way she kind of um, uh, dealt with um, that issue. I think there was some negative backlash from what I would call maybe uh, dark blue uh, politicians. That, that was the only thing that, that kind of that crossed my mind there. A kind of a, um, but I, I don't know whether that was something that, that uh, made any sense. I mean, that, that's something which I've completely omitted from this, the, the, the apology mm. and the, the, uh, the transitional justice going through in Taiwan. Um, so I, I don't want to... No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> but as, as far as um, any, um, anyone discounting the, the Austronesian narrative, I, I haven't heard of that. Mm. I've heard people s ignore it. I've heard that. Just for no, we're, we're Chinese, we're Chinese, mm -hmm. and that, it's, a, it's also something that you need to understand that within um, Aboriginal uh, communities, and, and correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, um, <laughs> but uh, I've often heard people say us Chinese, us Chinese mm -hmm. people, you know. So even if there's an Austronesian narrative now, there was another narrative before that. And how effective that narrative and how much that was internalized, I guess, would create this, this um, platform for debate. Um, but we can, we can sit here and say, well, they're all narratives. They're all just a discourse which is created through some form of representation. But I guess an easy question to answer is no, I haven't heard anyone critique that. Yes, go ahead. At the back. crazy amounts about the subject, so it's kind of been a door for me. But I was wondering about whether you think that having some sort of pride at or in cultural identity or having a kind of image that isn't kind of, um, that doesn't have Western influence, like politicians being in suits, maybe the thing of there being people representing a culture, do you think that's had influence in how other international relations, yeah, other countries have related to Taiwan? In a sense where, do you think there's, in the kind of idea of soft power, how there's a kind of, people are actually, have an idea of what Taiwan has so they can kind of have an exchange. But then also on the flip side of that, whether people, because when you had the map of um, the timeline of when the conferences started to come out, yeah, that's the one before? Oh, there. there we go, yeah. yeah. So I was wondering whether there's a correlation between where pe when indigenous people started to represent themselves and have some cultural pride in their own, whether that gave them a kind of empowerment to be able to speak out more about it or to be able to rep represent themselves in ways that they may not have been able to before. And maybe maybe that ties into why Austronesian narrative hasn't really been denied because at least it is slightly a more kind of reflective of some of the cultures at least. Mm -hmm. So it may, maybe it's appropriation, but maybe it's actually giving room for people to get the chance to actually represent themselves on a global scale. I think I think you brought up really, really important points. The idea that um, yeah, maybe this is misappropriate misappropriation, but you're still creating a stage, you're still create, creating promotion for these groups. Um, 
the strongest time for the Taiwanese uh, Aboriginal movement, so the social movement from indigenous peoples, was at the end of the 80s and the 90s, um, up to like 1996, we had the, the I guess the biggest, biggest success was where they had a government uh, ministry created for them. So then you have this problem of incorporation uh, of, of these once very um, motivated social activists into politicians, <laughs> right? So that's one side of it. So that was the first time. And then the other time, I would say, is probably now. I think mean, the amount of social movement happening all over Taiwan, not, not only in, in indigenous communities, um, is, is again peaking, I would say. Um, and the indigenous communities, they have a lot to talk about, they have a lot to discuss. Um, whether it's the, the transitional justice going on now, or if it's the return to land movement, which has been going on for a long time. Um, but there is a lot of movement. And I, I would assume myself that there's no correlation between the, the message from, from the government. Because activists, uh, they're not going to be impressed by these messages. It's never going to quite go far enough. And a lot of the time, the the condemnation of these of these campaigns is, why are you bringing a load of tourists into my village? We're trying to live here. You know, go away. Like, I, I don't know if anyone saw a great uh, form of resistance where a group of Aboriginal people went into the Ministry of uh, Tourism. Ministry of Tourism mm -hmm. and started taking pictures of people <laughs> working <laughs> and like turning the lights on and off. <laughs> Excuse me, do you have Wi-Fi? You know? <laughs> um, and that's great, but that is that is just coming from the success of these government mm. campaigns. You know, Taidong is beautiful. Go and see the Aboriginal peoples in their homes. You know <laughs> what? Um, so I, I don't think there is a correlation. But I, I definitely agree that for a marginalized group who have no space um, and no discourse created about themselves, then yeah, any platform is, is probably better than nothing. But I don't think indigenous yeah. peoples need that platform to be given to them. I think they are very um, competent to create it for themselves um, if the conditions are right. Go ahead. Hi. That was an interesting talk. What happened is, according to looking at that, that the people are getting more power. <laughs> and they are actually trying to get the law in. If they are strong enough and go in mm -hmm. to politics, they could put it into law. Mm -hmm. What I want to know is, although the politicians use the aborigines, did, do they really do the abor did the aborigines actually benefit? Now, we have to look Aww. at the bigger picture. Don't look at negative. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at how things move about, mm -hmm. it sits into, into the whole world. Mm. And with all those people going around the world of origin, they are actually networking. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'll tell you, I've been looking at this. I think it's actually very international about blood is thicker than water. I've got that, and uh, I was, that's what I was looking for you. China has offered all Malaysians who are Chinese. If they ever go back to, to China, they have got the right. So if you look at it internationally, they are trying to get people back. Those who have got education, who can make money or whatever. There is something going on internationally. I'll give you that website later on. And that is what you've got, you've got to see. 
when people communicate around the world with YouTube and everything, you never know what could happen. Mm. But when I look at that line, I'm seeing developments. Mm. You see, one of these days, when those speak aborigines, because it's power, their words are power, mm -hmm. if they get at the right time, they can put all those in law. Yeah. Um. Look at it. Look at the positive side. I think we've got to oh. look. Look at the positive side in everything. How can it work? If you think of Victorian time, suffragettes, that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. If you look at, at the timeline, so look in a different way. Get out of the box. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think the one way, I mean, it's very similar to the, the, the previous yeah. response that we know. had. Um, and as I said, this is, I'm really trying to look at where is the benefits, where, mm -hmm. where um, what are the I, positives I that are coming That's from. That's the negative, and those are the modern people who doesn't know culture, but they use it, and they never actually get in depth. But look, way there, mm. right, What? how would it benefit the people who get publicity free. Yeah. I mean, free publicity is good, but yeah. if you have no control over what that publicity I know, is saying... I know, but when they get into issue. power, when the youngsters yeah. get to know and demand what they want, they will get it. Yeah. Um, again, I... Okay. Yeah, That's well, that's just the next question. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to give a pitch. Thank you very much for your talk. It's very interesting. <laughs> um, uh, I was thinking, you know, when we're looking at microphone. No, I haven't. All right. Um, when we look at ways of like images of presenting things like that. Um, through previous exercises, I've been looking at a particular instance. I think it was in two thousand six, two thousand five. The um, I think it's New Taiwan Solidarity Union, not the green one, the blue one. Oh yeah, the Taiwan Solidarity Union. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Mei Chin, she was one of their one of their members. Do you know Mei Chin? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, um, you know the um, indigenous independent um, uh, legislator. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the ex, the, ex, uh, the actress turned politician. That's oh, what it is. Probably. God, it's <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, as the, that was a particular instance I found where she was um, basically she'd gone to Japan to Yasukuni when another guy from the Taiwan Solidarity Union had gone to say, oh well, to venerate all the Taiwanese war dead in China. And to me, that from both sides, I was looking at how ideas of Taiwanese identity was manipulated for their own political gain. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, from um, indigenous communities, are people who do things like that, are they called up on their bullshit, pretty much? Or are they, is it like, sort of, is there much awareness of things like that? <laughs> what's the, what's the bullshit? Ba basically, she's, she's trying to, from, from the situation, she was trying to present herself as the representative of indigenous people okay. and saying that no, they commit these trusted to my attribute, these, we've got this, and trying to play with this idea of collective suffering and like historical trauma. Mm. So I just wondered, like, within the wider community, to, you know, to maybe to add this, this like, sense of nuance to it, is the, does the community engage with people who try and do that as well? Because in terms of um, national identification, we would probably put her into the category of being quite a hardline Chinese nationalist. Mm -hmm. um, but sorry, this is going to say, and she's using the Aboriginal identity mm -hmm. in order to push that agenda forward. Mm -hmm. um, it's, not, it's not something that I've, that I've come across before. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no, I don't, I don't really know how to respond to that. It's something that, that, that should definitely be looked into. Uh, but just going back to the previous comment as well, either way, like for me, I, I don't see a problem with someone trying to, to speak out on behalf of other people. Because everyone knows that when someone speaks, they're really just speaking for themselves, mm. right? That's fair enough. Um, but the fact that as an Aboriginal person, she has the chance to do that. So she has control over her own words, um, which is just why I was going back to the mm. previous comment. This idea of control. Um, to have culture but to have no control um, isn't going to take you very far. Um, so this idea of control and the idea is not whether to have Aboriginal people in campaigns is good or bad. I, I would say probably my first answer would be it's good. But you meant right? power rather than control. But, no, I mean control. I mean in what sense? What 
way do I represent myself? If you if you want to put a picture of me, like as, and me as as in Daniel Davis, right? I would like to choose that picture because if you choose one when I'm on a beach, I'm not going to feel very happy about it. <laughs> so, yeah, you know? uh, <laughs> so it's this idea of the whole lot. You cannot. It takes time. Once you actually people know about you, then they know what it's all about. Yeah. But you need your publicity first. You need to be heard first, internationally or nationally. Okay. You see, once you've got that, and you've got the right person, if you look at history, people always use someone. Yeah. Very seldom they don't. Politicians I'm talking about. Mm. But you see, when it comes to a certain stage where people know these people, and the people will say, oh, I like that. I can be a politician and talk for my own. I just, I guess, a very own track. A simple way to say, it's a, it's, it's a big shame that if for any movement to, to have substance, you need a martyr. That's you know? That's I, it. That is nature. <coughs> That's the way nature works. So if you actually look at the positive side, turn it over. Anyone who used me, I can always turn it to a better way. It's okay. in a different way. Not, not the fight way. The way, okay, if I get invited up, I chop my piece. Yeah. As the aborigines. But yeah. I'm given the stage. That's the difference. That is wisdom. Okay. okay, I think on that Sorry. note then we should... No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've, uh, we've got some um, uh, wine, so we can continue our discussion over, over wine. But let's thank uh, Daniel for returning to... Uh, <laughs>